Hello, I'm Daniel from Teach Kids Robotics, and today we'll be going over lesson one, what is a robot? A brief introduction to robots. So, what is a robot? Is a phone a robot? How about a microwave? How about R2-D2 or BB-8? All of these three objects share the same mechanical traits. They're made out of metal and they may have chips inside of them. However, we differentiate R2-D2 as a robot, but not a microwave, which is a consumer appliance. So, what is the differentiating factor between these? Uh, to identify what is a robot, we have to first come up with a definition that encompasses a robot specifically. So, a robot is a goal-oriented machine that can generally sense, plan, and act autonomously. So what do each of these mean? Sense means it's able to sense the environment, and it knows what's going on around it, such as there being a wall uh, four feet to the left of me. Plan means it's able to make decisions based on the environment, such as not running into a wall. And act means carrying out the actual decision. So this is to making sure that a car, for instance, would steer away from hitting another object. Now when we say autonomously, this refers to the ability for a robot to act without human intervention in, of any kind. So exploring this in more detail, what does it mean to sense? Let's consider the electronic car on the right. How would this car know if it would run into a wall? It needs to know about or sense its environment. So the car has eyes in the form of ultrasonic sensors, which let it see what is in front of it by sending sound waves and measuring how long it takes for the sound waves to return. The quicker the return, the closer it is to the wall. What does it mean to plan? Consider the car on the right again. It may have a goal to drive around without hitting a wall. It could then plan to only drive forward if there's no wall in front of it. Software running on an onboard computer such as an Arduino is used for decision making to control how the car drives based on what it sees or senses. The plan, such as turn when you see a wall, helps achieve the goal, don't drive into a wall, and is executed by the onboard computer. Finally, what does it mean to act? So the action a robot takes in the real world is done in the act step. Consider the car on the right. How would it act to change direction if it was driving into a wall? So the car would act by steering away, turning its wheels in a different direction electronically, and if there was no wall, it could continue steering straight ahead. Putting all these three objects together, we can identify why we consider this electronic car to be a robot. It can have a goal of not hitting a wall and driving around. It can sense if there is a wall using its ultrasonic sensor. It can plan to change direction or continue based on whether or not there's a wall in front of it. And it can act by turning its wheels if there is a wall so that it can continue driving without running into the wall. Let's apply this framework now to define why film robots such as WALL-E or BB-8 are in fact robots. We can see they all share goals, whether they be compacting trash or fixing starfighters. We can see they have sensors, such as the binocular-like lenses at the top of Wally, -E, or the various eye-looking lenses on BB-8. We can see they all have plans, whether they be to help the protagonist or to solve a Rubik's Cube. And we can see they're capable of acting in the real world, actuating and moving their motors, enabling them to either roll around as BB-8 or move their arms and roll around as Wally. -E. Finally, where can we find robots today, in the real world? Robots in real life aim to do dull, dirty, or dangerous jobs that make them a better option than humans, including agricultural robots for farming, warehouse robots to move things around, cleaning robots to clean floors, or robots for exploration in environments that would be too harsh for humans, such as the Mars rover from NASA talking about how robots experience the world, let's first ask ourselves how do humans experience the world? The five senses allow us humans to do everyday tasks by understanding the world around us. Each of our five senses uses a different part of our body. For example, sight comes from our eyes, touch from our hands, hearing from our ears, taste from our mouth, and smell from our nose. Each of these five senses 
are used in our daily tasks. Let's reflect on how each of these senses would go and help us learn at school. For example, when we're in the car or driving a car, we need to use our sight in order to see the world around us and make sure we don't hit other cars. We need to use our touch in order to know we're moving the steering wheel, gas and brake pedals. We need to use our hearing to know when someone is honking. And we need to use, for example, our taste and our smell in case there is a gas leak. Once we're at the school, we use our hearing to hear what the teacher is saying, our sight in order to see what's going on on the blackboard. During lunch, when we're eating, we use our sense of smell to know if our food is good or not. All of these different senses help us achieve our task, such as going to school. The same way humans have eyes and ears and nose and mouth, which allows us to sense specific things about the world around us, robots use mechanical sensors to sense what is around them. Now there are equivalents here. For example, for an eye, a robot can use a camera. For a mouth, a robot could use a gas sensor. For feeling, a robot can use tactile pressure sensors. For hearing, a robot can use a microphone. Depending on the goal of the robot, specific sensors are used to understand the environment it's operating in in order to achieve that task. A common sensor is a LiDAR, which is a laser that shoots into the environment and the duration it takes for that laser wave to be reflected back to the LiDAR is a way to determine how far away a given object is in the environment. Let's take a specific look at sight. Consider a digital camera. It processes light the same way our eyes do, but instead of saving that image, we can take the raw digital ones and zeros that make up the image and actually process them in a computer using a technique known as computer vision in order to identify what is actually in the image. The same way when we're looking out into the world, we see and identify objects around us. There are two types of robot sensors, passive and active. A passive sensor relies on the ambient energy in the world around it to perform a measurement, such as a satellite camera that absorbs the sun's light and looks at the reflections to generate a digital image of the Earth. Or consider a thermometer that uses the ambient temperature of the world around it in order to increase what it reads. On the active side, we have sensors that transmit energy into the environment to allow for a measurement, such as a satellite that shoots a laser at the Earth and looks for reflected waves in order to compute the distance between it and the Earth. Another common sensor, again, that would be active is like the LiDAR, which shoots lasers into the world around it to determine the distance between it and the reflected wave. Let's look at a specific example. The NASA Valkyrie robot is a humanoid-style robot that can walk around. But how is it capable of walking around without hitting anything? It uses a multitude of sensors in order to achieve this. First, it uses an initial inertial measurement unit or an IMU in order to help stay stabilized so that it knows when it's falling down, similar to the liquid inside of our ears. It uses a camera for object detection and to determine if the path in front of it is open. It uses a laser scanner to determine the distance from objects around it so that it doesn't actually run into anything. And it uses four sensors in its feet to determine whether or not both of its feet are on the ground. Considering sensors in more detail at a general level, sensors have three main properties. They have noise, or the amount of random energy that's in the environment that the sensor will read that can affect the reading, such as when your microphone is on and you hear static. They have resolution, which is the degree of accuracy the dis that a sensor can provide, such as distance on the order of meters or centimeters. As, and we can think of that also like a microscope, giving different levels of resolution. You can see more with a greater degree of resolution. Finally, we also have precision, or the reproducibility of measurements. If you were to sample the same environment multiple times with the same sensor, uh, the sensor reading may actually change. And to limit that change, we would like a high precision sensor. Now we consider all these three attributes because the cost of the sensor itself can change 
depending on how high quality and how precise and how high resolution with reduced noise we would like the sensor to have. Finally, sensors often require calibration, which is when the sensor is reading a value that differs from the actual value in the real world. Consider, for example, a weight scale that reads two pounds when nothing is on it. We would need to calibrate this weight scale by subtracting two pounds from all of its readings so that it would correctly show zero pounds when nothing is on it. Consider a digital thermostat that was reading 72 degrees when in fact we know it's 75 degrees outside. How would we calibrate it to fix this? We would simply increase thermostat's reading so that it displays three more degrees since we know that it's representing the wrong value by three degrees. So this sensor calibration is often done in robotics since all of our sensors may be slightly off as they're manufactured in slightly different mechanical components so that we calibrate them so that they provide accurate readings based on the environment around them. So, humanoid style robots often have eyes that allow them to see but how do they work? These robots often have two lens-like objects, but how do they work really, knowing what's in the environment? So, if we consider sensors again, a digital camera is a sensor that allows a robot to take a picture of the environment to identify what's going on around it. Cameras are found in many robots today, from cars, to robotic arms, to robotic laundry machines. But, how do cameras actually let robots see? Digital cameras enable computer vision, by which a computer can process an image and understand what is inside using math. So consider the image on the right. We can separate this digital image into a grid, and then we can perform mathematical operations on that grid in order to classify or identify what is in the image. And we can see on the right side, we can identify the dog or the bike or the car in the background, all using math on the original image. But how does this work really? So let's first consider what is a camera image. Since computers understand the world digitally, in binary with ones and zeros, this means that for a camera image, the image must be represented digitally as well. So to represent the image, we can convert that into a grid and that grid can be represented as a matrix of numbers and in this example below we have a heart which can be represented as a heart on a grid and then that grid can be transformed into a grid of numbers known as a matrix where that set of numbers reflects what is actually going on in the original image what is a matrix exactly a matrix is simply what we call a set of rows and columns <clears throat> that, if we consider screen resolution, can be like 1920 by 1080. A matrix with 1920 rows and 1080 columns. We can also represent an image as a matrix by converting it to a grid of 1920 by 1080 blocks, filling in each block with a pixel. Now a pixel is the term for the individual dot in the image. And this contains information about color that helps us build up the original image. So, what can we do once we have this matrix? This mathematical representation of the real world or an image, known as this matrix, allows us to perform operations known as convolutions on the matrix to identify different features of the image, such as edges. In the picture to the left, we can see the edges of the original image are clearly defined, but these were identified using simply a single matrix operation. If we think to ourselves, how, what, how do we identify an edge in an image? We can determine it to be a, an area in our original matrix in which the set of numbers differ greatly from the numbers around them, because this would form an edge. Consider the line with the corresponding matrix on the right. Finally, what is convolution and how does it work? We can visualize convolution as this matrix operation by which we multiply one matrix by another in order to get a resulting matrix 
that has inf information encoded inside of it, such as the boundary edges of the original image. This submatrix is known as a kernel, and different kernels allow us to perform different operations on the image, such as performing image blurring, or border detection, or sharpening. Putting it all together, taking digital camera images, translating them to matrices, and performing mathematical operations on those matrices through convolutions, allow us to classify using mathematical models what actually is in an image. Now these, these images and post-processed matrices full of data can be fed to special models which are kind of pre-trained pieces of artificial intelligence which can look at these numbers and identify key features that make up either a person or a car or a traffic light. Switching from digital cameras to another sensor, the LiDAR, we can go and investigate another way robots are able to see the world around them. So while cameras are great for computer vision, they have a key limitation, which says that they rely on light in the environment since they're a passive sensor. So this can be problematic if you're operating at night or in low light environments. So a popular sensor is known as a LiDAR, or light detection and ranging, which is an active sensor that sends laser beams into the environment and measures the time it takes for the reflection to return. So how does LiDAR work? LiDAR is actually found in cars today and is used in the safety systems to enable, for example, the automatic braking. And it shoots lasers into the environment and is able to calculate based on the time it takes the light pulses to reflect to see how far away a given object is. Now, what does this actually look like? So this data, this, this laser scan information on the return rays can also be stored in a matrix. And this matrix is known as a point cloud, since every point or laser that is returned gives us information about how far away and how far that laser traveled. So the scene on the left, if you were to visualize how does a LiDAR see it, we can see on the right, there's no sense of color, there's only depth information, because we only know how far each individual ray of light traveled before it returned to our sensor. Now, depth information is really useful for applications such as self-driving cars, because we're not interested in what something looks like, we're only interested in how far away it is, and whether or not we're going to hit it. So, how do robots know where they are? First, let's consider how humans know where they are, which is using maps. Consider a map of the United States. We can often divide where we are on a map using coordinates known as latitude and longitude. With either of these two numbers, we'll know exactly where we are in the United States. Or consider on your smartphone, you can use an app like Google Maps to show you exactly where you are relative to streets around you with an exact address on the map. Now, in the same way us humans have maps that show us where we are relative to other features uh, in our surrounding, robots also have maps. But what do robot maps look like? For example, for mobile robots, 3D space is often translated into a 2D representation of the environment, with obstacles kind of sh shown and free space highlighted as two separate colors. We can see in this image here that the robot, highlighted in blue, maps directly to the robot on the map equivalent that shows free space and where obstacles are. A map showing kind of free space and where obstacles are is known as an occupancy grid, and it reflects not only where the robot is, but also where the robot can move. And this grid is often stored in a matrix, or basically a large set of rows and columns representing space, equivalent to the grid image on the left. Now, what do coordinates look like in a 2D robot map? It's common in mobile robots. So just how we have latitude and longitude for a map, we also have some coordinate system in our robot map as well. And this coordinate is often referred to as pose. Now the pose for a mobile robot could be something like the angle or direction that it's facing, 
relative to some starting point, as well as its offset, or x and y position, uh, how far it's moved from that starting point in its map. Now, how do these robot maps actually get created? So, a common technique to create a robot map is known as SLAM, or Simultaneous Localization Mapping. We can visualize SLAM on the right. Notice as the robot moves around the space, it uses its sensors to both avoid obstacles and remember uh, key features that it's seen, such as walls and hallways. Using these features, it's able to determine where it is in its map that it's created. Now, the term we use to refer to how a robot knows where it is, or where a robot is in its map that it's created, is localization. Now, localization is going to give us, basically, the information about where a robot is, what its pose is inside of the map. Now, you can think of this as a problem where if we were to blindfold someone and put them in a room and then take the blindfold off, it would take them a few seconds to look around the room and understand where exactly they are based on things they see, such as signs or windows, to figure out where they are in a building. In the same way, a robot also, when it initially begins trying to identify where it is within its map, will look around using its sensors such as a LiDAR, such as the blue laser scans in this example GIF above me. And as it moves around, it sees what kind of features are in its environment, such as open hallways, or a closed set of rooms with potentially chairs or tables. And as it moves around, it can have a better idea or a greater probability of where it is based on what it sees around it. Because if there are walls nearby, you know you can't be in an open hallway. Now this uh, method by which the robot can look at its environment and determine what it sees to rule out where it possibly could be uh, is a high level description of a technique known as particle filtering, which is kind of visualized on the right with the red particles reflecting probabilities of where the robot could be. And as the robot moves around, it can hone in and improve the probabilities to really uh, get a high degree of accuracy to where it is within its map. So, how does a robot decide what to do? From our first lesson, we determined a robot is a goal-oriented machine. And with mobile robots, the goal often revolves around moving between points in a map. But there are often multiple ways to move between two places. So how do we pick which path to take? Consider, for example, if you've, you've used Google Maps, and you can see there are multiple routes getting you from a starting location to your destination. How do you determine which one of these routes is best? So, we can choose to take either the shortest path, or the fastest path, or the path that avoids toll roads. But for all of these, there is a metric we are trying to optimize. For the shortest path, we want to minimize the length of the path. For fastest time, we want to minimize the duration of a path. This allows us to mathematically compare best possible paths and choose what is best for that metric, whether it be distance or time or cost. Now, in mobile robotics, this field is known as path planning. Path planning answers the question of how does a robot travel between two points in its map optimally, and it does so with the help of something known as a heuristic. The heuristic is the property that helps guide the search to get the best path, and that can encode information such as cost or time, or a preference in this example here, getting from the start to the goal point, we can see two different paths, but one has significantly less turns, or the other also decides to stay closer to walls for longer periods of time. Now in path planning, we have something known as a cost function, which can help determine the best path from a start to a goal point by encoding costs at different parts of our map. And using this cost function, we can help encode information about where we would or would not like to travel. For example, an obstacle can have a high cost associated with it, so that as we are determining how to travel between the map, if we are attempting to reduce the cost of a path 
we would avoid any kind of obstacle. So this cost function allows us really to determine the path planning behavior and the path we're going to take. And a map with a cost function applied to each point inside is known as a cost map. And we can use this cost map to find a least cost path between two points in the map that we wish to travel between. And we will use this cost function to find the best or the lowest cost path between the two points. And we have a visualization here of what a map looks like with a cost map equivalent. And you can see, for example, we have additional costs indicated by the darker purple colors associated with being near an obstacle. And the free space is at lower cost, indicating we prefer to move in this area. Now, consider we have this cost function. We want to be able to actually determine how do we get from point A to point B in the map. And to do so, we use something known as a search function, which basically attempts to find a path between the two points on the map. And this path is found basically uh, in an exploratory manner. And there are different kind of search functions that have different behavior, which result in trade-offs in optimality which is whether or not the path found is actually the shortest or the best, depending on what your metric is. And we can see these two path approaches visualized, one always attempting to minimize the distance to the path on the left, and the other simply testing every possible path until it finds the goal in order to determine what the shortest path actually is. Now, returning to our cost function, by adding costs when we're doing this calculation to determine the shortest path, by finding the shortest path, we actually found the lowest cost path between points. Because we can, inc we can consider distance also like a weight or a cost. And by finding the shortest path between two points or the shortest distance, we also find the shortest cost between those two points. The next step, once a robot knows where it is in the map, it's decided it has a start and a goal point, it's found what it considers the best path is from that start to goal point in its map, it actually needs to figure out how it can realize that planned path in the real world using the motors available to it. This final piece is known as trajectory planning or motion planning and reconciles how a robot is actually able to move with what the plan was for the robot to move. And this allows us to close the gap between the robot's perception of the world and its movement in the real world. Using another real world example, we return to the NASA Valkyrie robot. And every possible combination of ways that the robot could move uh, is captured in what we call the configuration space. And path planning or trajectory planning determines how to actually move the robot in this configuration space. Consider that this robot here has different axes of rotation highlighted in red. What this means is the robot is limited in how it can move. Perhaps its arm can only move up or down. As a result, if the plan dictates that the robot move in a curve-like manner, there has to be some reconciliation that takes place as the robot needs to essentially move maybe its torso as it moves its arm up and down in order to achieve this curve-like direction that was planned in the configuration space. So that concludes pretty much the ex explanation of how does a robot decide what to do. Normally, the robot has some sort of heuristic or some sort of cost it's trying to reduce and it has this cost map that it's moving or operating in, and it would like to find the optimal way to move between two points in that cost map. It uses a search function to find that path in its cost map, and then translates that planned path into the real world using motion planning or trajectory planning. Once again, this is more of a specific use case to mobile robots, and different kind of robots have different systems in place. But for mobile robots, you'll often see these cost maps dictating how they move and determine how to move between two points on the map. So, let me know, what else would you like to learn about robotics? 
feel free to leave a comment below and check out the links in the description for other robotics kit and information. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below. This video has been brought to you by Teach Kids Robotics. You can visit us at teachkidsrobotics.com to check out other information and blog posts regarding robotics. Additionally, we offer curated lists of STEM kits in order for you to try robotics at home. Check out the link in the description.